Okay, thanks for joining everyone. Um, welcome to the EMS series. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Berenholtz. I am a anesthesia and critical care physician at Hopkins. I um, am an active member at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving in the medical director's office as CAR 609. On behalf of the medical director's uh, office, Dr. Bitberg, Dr. Sagel, Dr. Pollock, and others, uh, thanks for joining. On behalf of the EMS office, Director Shenning, Captain Willits, Captain Stewart, Captain Nats, thank you for your support. Thank you for everything that you guys do. Thank you for your commitment to lifelong learning. We'll also be joined by a young member, Ashley, um, uh, who is a member of Pikesville. She's going to be helping us run the Zoom platform. She also will be available in the chat. Keep an eye out for the chat, for the sign-in sheet for this uh, online training. Uh, we are approved for two hours of MIMS credit. Uh, Ashley will be sending out a link uh, via the chat. Anyone who's watching this on your own or volunteers who are watching as a group, keep an eye on the chat for the link uh, to make sure you sign in so you can get your CEUs. Uh, for the career departments that are joining as a group, I do believe that Captain uh, Stewart uh, has already sent out a roster. If you're not aware of that or if you have any questions, feel free to uh, text me uh, or uh, uh, send me a message in the chat uh, along the way. Uh, tonight we have uh, Dr. Um, Kirshner. Dr. Kirshner is a licensed clinical social worker, mental health clinician specializing in mental health trauma. Dr. Kirshner has worked in the area of medical health, uh, mental health for first responders for 28 years, and he is on five SISM teams, including the Baltimore County Fire Department SISM team. I also know that Dr. Kirshner is actively in his EMT class, so how amazing is that? Thank you so much for your commitment to the fire service over more than 30 years and for what you do for all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Well, good evening. So um, this Zoom experience is new for me, um, except for right now the EMT class, which our first Zoom meeting was last night. And the Zoom meetings that I'm having on individual sessions. So I will try to pay attention to the Zoom chat um, and answer any questions as they come along. I did ask um, how long you all want this to go. And I said that I will go as long as you all want this to go and answer whatever questions I can for you. Um, I am guessing that the people on board here this evening are all fire, EMT, EMS, paramedic people. Um, so um, what I'd like you all to do, if you would please, is if, if there's anything that you want to start with or questions that you have when you've just joined in that you'd like to make sure I, I address, by all means, put that in the chat or say something so that I will be sure to cover that in the conversation that we're having. So the first thing I'd like to do is talk to you about what is this um, fear, worry, anxiety that is so pervasive in not only our professional community, but across all communities. And, and um, Doc, we lost your video. I just see your name up on the screen, so don't know what that means. Um, let me start by saying that the fear right now is a very natural experience for everyone. Anyone who says they don't have a certain degree of fear, well, everyone does, and everyone's going to have a certain amount of that. Um, what fear is, is planning the negative experience that may happen. We sort of do this predictive um, model in our head of what potentially could happen, and then our emotional reaction to that is fear. We don't fear things that happened in the past. We fear things that may happen. Um, and that gives us a sense of emotional discomfort when we do that. Um, hang on, there's the mouse. Okay, so, but let me give you a, a quick, an acronym here. Fear is fantasy expressed as reality. Um, and this kind of experience where we have this fantasy and fantasy, um, doesn't always have to be positive. It can, fantasy is any kind of um, dream state or um, belief state that we create in our mind, but we express it as a reality. We think of it as being real. We think of it as being uh, something that's 
true to be happening. And that's why we say it's expressed as a reality because it really isn't a reality. It's still in the fantasy world of what's being predicted. Now, worrying again is we plan something. A worry isn't something that's going on now. We worry about something that's going to happen or that may happen. So again, we're predicting things. Now, one of the things to do is to realize that all of us are in this as a community. And worry, when you share it with others, sort of takes away the sting of um, worry. I will tell you that every once in a while, um, Station 17 or Station 39 does drive by my office here on York Road. So if you hear the, the air horns going off, they often do say hello on the way by. Um, that one just, one, I think the truck just went by, but it didn't blow the air horn. But you will hear that occasionally. So there's something called universality. We're all in this together. Now, what happens with universality is that it, it has the tendency to take away some of the fear, some of the worry, because we share it with others. How many of you have probably sat around the table at the firehouse and talked about all the things that are going on now or talked about the things that have gone on in the past? And when you do that, people make jokes, people laugh, and it decreases the emotional experience of this intense fear or worry that comes up. And also it, it gives an opportunity to share knowledge. Knowledge often decreases worry and fear. The best thing to do in that case is to really, if you're not at the firehouse, is to reach out and talk to other people, get a sense of what other people are doing so that you're not there by yourself. Um, being alone, and I, I don't know how many of you have gotten the emails that I've been sending out, but being alone in this isolation increases fear and increases worry because there's a lack of knowledge and a lack of connection to other people. So if you're not in the firehouse or if you're not around friends, that's a time to start reaching out to other people so that will decrease the worry, decrease the fears. Um, so if you're texting me, it is probably best to do it in the chat. Yes, I will talk more about how fear relates to marriage. Okay, so some I, I think a lot of Baltimore County Fire has my cell phone number, and so some of you who are texting me on my phone, it's probably better to put in the chat because I might miss it on the phone rather than there, um, rather than, than on the chat. Um, how do you deal with fear when you're on a call? Well, let's be clear. There are concerns about contracting the COVID-19 virus. Okay, so what do you do about that fear? Well, we can't make the fear go away because that's real. And we have to understand that certain fears are absolutely valid and they're, they're real. But what you can do is follow the protocols, follow the guidelines to the best of your ability and make sure that everybody on your team is also doing the same. The amount of control that we have over this virus is the amount of control we have over the actions that we take. That's where our control is. And we'll get more into control in a little bit and how control and powerless contribute to fear. But the one thing that you can do when you're on a call is follow the recommendations. Um, I'm, uh, as the doc said, I am taking this EMT class and, and you all will be my great teachers. And, and, but one of the things that is, the, the thing that is most emphasized is the scene safe. And every one of these questions and all the quizzes that I'm taking, and dear God, I hate these quizzes. Um, but all these quizzes, if you see anything in there that says scene safe or scene safety, that's the answer. So the control you have in protecting yourself in the scene safety, um, and thank you, that's the number one lesson that I've been learning in EMT class. If we do that, that can help us with the fear and the worry because you're protecting yourself through the protocols and the the design that's been given out by the CDC and by the, the, the fire department and your own medical directors. Uh, some of the American Psychological Association guidelines for managing this kind of trauma, firstly is limit your exposure to the news. Balance between being informed and being obsessed. All right, I'm sure everybody here has been going on the news and we talk about it around the firehouse and we talk about it with your friends and, and people become very obsessed with this and it's easy to do right now because um, everybody is talking about it. But try to develop some kind of balance, even around the firehouse. If it gets to be too much, be the person who raises your hand and say, hey, let's talk about something different. Let's put a movie up. 
let's do something else besides just talk about this virus all day, every single day you're on the shift. So that kind of balance will help to diminish the fear, diminish the worry. Um, yes, well, okay. I'm gonna to get to some of these questions that, um, okay. Don't text me, <laughs> put it in the chat. All right, get engaged in other things. Um, I see a lot of people going downstairs, working out in the gym or upstairs or wherever your gym is. Do something besides just sit in front of the television, watching the news. Um, I, I, I hang out a lot at 17 and, and fortunately they don't have the news on either in the watch room, <clears throat> excuse me, or in the kitchen. So do that differently. Get, it, get out of the, that pattern of watching the news. Um, the other thing is get grounded in the here and now. What's going on immediately? So instead of fantasizing about what will come, get involved in what's going on now, whether it's a training that's going on in the firehouse, whether it's somebody's getting married. Um, one of the things I find most wonderful about being around the firehouse is somebody's something going. And so um, get involved in the fun part, get involved in the enjoyable part of what you do rather than um, can someone tell me whether the internet is working well? Cause mine just flashed up saying the internet is unstable. Are you all able to hear me? Okay. Hey, so it's definitely a little bit breaky just for the last couple of seconds though. Before that, it was great. Okay. I think uh, you're good right now. We're good. Okay. Very good. Uh, do some things that are healthy for you. You're freezing at times. Okay. Um, if you can, um, if I need to, I can take a break and plug in hardwire into the internet. So if it keeps freezing, please let me know and I'll take a quick break and I'll, I'll plug in hardwire. Uh, can N95 be clean with UV flash, the hospital where I'm employed say, you know what, I'm going to leave that to Dr. Sean and, uh, because I'm a mental health clinician. And so those are questions I can't answer for you, but um, perhaps the doctor can, and I'll leave that to him. I'm gonna stick to the mental health part, okay? Not to put you off, but if we can do that, would be great. Um, do you wanna answer that now, or do you want to hold off and do that later? I'm happy to tell in the chat, no worries, keep going. Okay. What happens to first responders, medical personnel in the midst of treating patients? All right, so what happens is we get panic. You get the call and how many times I've been sitting around with all you guys and they're like, oh, here comes, you, you get a call and trouble breathing. And, and I hear the, the sigh, I hear the, oh boy, and you know, masking up and face masks and gowns and so on. This has a tendency when you get on a call to make people freeze. It's not unusual. People do freeze. People do panic. Um, if you feel yourself getting to that place where you freeze or you panic, your partner's there. Your partner can kind of give you a nudge and say, hey, come on back. Um, and or your partner may need to take over at that time. Also be aware of your partner, whether your partner is freezing, whether your partner is in that panic. Um, you hear it when the call first comes out, people are, um, concerned about going on the call, your first step is go over your protocol. When you're going to the call, the two of you are in the front of the medic, you're in the fire engine, how are you going to go through it? Um, I don't have all the special terms that you guys talk about. Um, I, I, I've heard them, but I can't remember exactly what the terms were. Uh, there are a number of approved processes to clean 95. I would, I would defer to your hospital epidemiology folks. Okay, there you go. Um, answered your question. So, uh, but just, if you familiarize yourself before you get to the call and you work closely with your partner on the call to follow your protocols, it will decrease the anxiety. It will decrease the panic and the worry that you have. Um, be aware that it is not uncommon. It is quite common for you to experience being a bit more snappy, more irritable, uh, not having as much patience 
when you're on a call that's stressful. Um, if you are the recipient of your partner's irritability and snappiness, you guys have been working together long enough, have some kind of code that isn't threatening, isn't attacking, but just says, hey, um, we're doing it. We're, we're getting ourselves in that anxious mode. We're, we're snapping at each other. Um, there's enough relationships between partners. It doesn't need to go unsaid because when it goes unsaid, it gets worse. So come up with some kind of a way to say to each other, hey, the stress is getting to us. Um, we need to take a breath and just realize it's not you against me. It's us against the virus and, and the, the stress. And, and that's how you'll work through it. Um, it is common for people to become less patient, more irritable, more tired. Uh, when you notice these things happening to you, it's time to actually talk about it. It's time to say something about it rather than let it go quiet. All right, scroll down. Um, uh, okay, we already did that. Okay, so focus on the here and now. What's happening on the call? It's easy to get wrapped up in the fear. Um, you become blinded by the fear often. And then what ends up happening is mistakes are made. And that makes more worry because you fantasize about, oh, was my mask on right? Oh, was my face shield on right? Was, did I have the gown? What did I do? What did I not do? Um, if you stop and you slow down, the mistakes can happen. Uh, I've heard you guys over and over say, it's not my emergency. Well, that's true. If you have a wreck on the way to a call, because you made it your emergency, that person's not going to get your help. So slow down um, to the extent that you're cautious and you do what you need to do so that things get done right. Okay, so um, one of the biggest issues that I see with professional helpers is the fantasy of being in control. Um, None of us like that feeling of powerlessness. None of us like that feeling of not having control. Um, you will notice that the majority of people who are in your line of work like to be the driver when you're not even at work. You want to be in control of the steering wheel. You want to be the person, if there's two cars going, you want to be the person in the front uh, guiding the train. So it's common for you also to be the person who says, I want to be the one to fix this person. I want to be the one to save this person. Um, I want to be in stores every day. How much danger am I? I'm a volunteer. My full-time job requires me to be in stores every day. How much danger? Well, I don't know that you're in any more danger if you're taking the precautions that are necessary to take. So uh, do, do your standard precautions, whether it's wearing your mask, wearing your gloves, you're in less danger. So it goes back to being aware of the proper protocols and how to work these protocols. Um, you can't control everything, everybody. There's no way to be constantly in control. Um, our control really ends at the um, outer layer of our skin. We can't control other people. There's these people walking around, they cough, they whatever. We can bark at them, we can yell at them. They're gonna do whatever they're gonna do, but we have a responsibility to protect ourselves, And that's the only person we can control. We can't control outside of ourselves, And that's where it all starts. Now, um, if you know people who are in the AA program or any of the Anon programs, they have that serenity prayer. And I'm sure you probably have all heard, you know, where they say, hey, um, I can protect uh, myself by controlling what I can control being aware of what I can control and knowing the difference between the two. Okay, so that goes back to, do you have the ability to control a situation? When you get on scene, um, it's an emergency scene. You can control what you can, but there's always gonna be something that comes up that you didn't plan for. And because you are emergency responders, you're trained how to deal with the unexpected. And so when something comes up, even with this virus that's unexpected, you will be able to control only what you can through your experience and your training. Questions so far? Okay, we got to keep going. Um, is it necessary to wear a mask while you're in your vehicle? 
Well, I don't know. First of all, that's not a psychological question. Um, if it makes you feel better, I'll go with it that way. If it makes you feel better to wear a mask when you're in your vehicle, wear the mask when you're in your vehicle. Um, my understanding, and um, Dr. Sean can maybe chime in with this, is the, the masks that the majority of people are wearing are not masks to protect you from others. They're masks that are protect others from you, unless you have the N95 mask. Um, but that, again, I'm going to leave to Dr. Sean on the medical yeah, side. That's, yeah, that's definitely accurate. Okay. Definitely accurate. The masks that we are all fitted for through the county fire department are fitted uh, in a way that, and they're made up of material that prevents that virus from coming in the sides or from coming directly in through the mask. Uh, the cloth masks that folks are wearing around in public are predominant, don't have the same filtration quality. They allow air into the sides for sure because they're not fitted and they are being used predominantly to spread, to prevent uh, virus shedding if you uh, uh, have a, uh, an infection and may not quite be symptomatic yet, it prevents your own respiratory uh, secretion, so it protects others. I think that's right. So what I'm hearing from Chuck, though, is a lot of the worry that's going on on the everyday how to manage this, okay? And, and that's, I think, what's really important here is information... Um, okay, I'm going to get to that. Um, D. Pruitt, I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. Um, but what, what, I, what I hear from Chuck is the importance of getting good information. Okay. Um, let's see. When you, what you're asking are all these really good questions that are showing the importance of getting good medical information, good scientific information that we'll be talking about. Um, how to protect yourself, whether you're in your vehicle, uh, wherever you are. So you're validating the importance of getting good scientific information in order to um, decrease the worry, decrease the fears. So can you expect, and um, I'm going to talk a little in, in a little bit about the signs and the symptoms of peers who are under stress. So give me just a few minutes and we'll get to that. Um, expectations. Expectations also cause fear. You have certain expectations of what will happen, certain expectations of what won't happen, what you fear may happen. And so when you do that, you're coming to this place where things are not what you expect them to be. They are what they are. And that's how emergencies happen. And that's where all of you come in, is that you have an expectation. It didn't happen the way you expected it to. So we talk about cognitive distortions, these things that we have in our mind that sort of, um, they're based in fantasy, these distorted thoughts that say, I should be in control of all things at all times. But it's not a reality, and we can't be in control of all things at all times. No matter how good of a doctor you are, no matter how good of a paramedic or an EMT or a firefighter, things are gonna happen that you didn't want to have happen, you didn't expect to have it happen, but it happened anyway, and we have to be able to um, accept things that aren't um, in our plans. All right, so now we're going to really move on to these relationship questions. Um, I know we that was sort of one of the things that Dr. Sean asked me to talk about was relationships. Um, relationships suffer a lot during stress. Uh, people have a problem with communicating. Their communication can be more uh, frustrating, more angry. People don't uh, when they're talking to their spouse or even their kids or coworkers, they don't talk about the particular issue. Sometimes they bring up all different kinds of things from the past or things that are unrelated. We call it unfair fighting. So um, you have to stick to the topic. You have to um, work on what the issue is and listen to what the person is saying because uh, they're going to be talking out of fear. You're going to be talking out of fear which ends up you talking out of anger. The things that you say um, may represent the, the, the feelings that you have that aren't directly related to a problem. For instance, um, I had a couple come into my office. They were arguing over the, uh, the setting on the air conditioner uh, in the house. 
Well, that really wasn't the problem at all. They were fearful and worried about the amount of money that was being spent. But they spent about 40 minutes in my office arguing about the, uh, the setting on the air conditioner until I finally said to them, you let them argue for a while and then you kind of sit back and you go, okay, um, what's really going on here? And I said, well, what is your fear? What are you worried about? Well, we're going to be spending all this money. We don't have all this money. So really the fear was the lack of a job. The fear was being laid off. Where's the money going to come from? How are we going to be able to pay for this? So the real issue was the fear, and it wasn't really about the air conditioner at all. So kind of pay attention to what the feelings are that are being expressed. There's frustration that happens. You'll notice that even on a call, um, when you're communicating about something, you might say it with more of an irritable tone, more of a frustrated tone, when really that's not the way you mean it. it you're just expressing the feelings differently than you would on a regular call. Um, stress does encourage or does facilitate people to communicate harshly because your nerves are on edge. So you're more likely to say things more harshly, not as compassionately, not as understanding. I'm going to use the same kind of emergency um, philosophy and say, slow down. When you're communicating, take your time, say what you want to say, but not with the ad hominem attacks, not with the personal attacks, and, and not making it so that it's um, throwing daggers or insulting, but just express your feelings. Maybe start by talking about what you feel rather than what someone has done to you. I feel is a whole lot more productive than you did. Um, and when someone is doing a whole lot of you did, that has more of a tendency to be expressing the frustration rather than, I feel hurt when you said this. I feel worried when you spent this money. I feel really anxious when you turn the air conditioner down a lot. So um, when people are stressed, they don't argue or talk rationally. There's a whole lot of blaming. There's a whole lot of accusations. Often this is when the fight starts is because you're being irrational. You're not really talking clearly. So one of the signs and symptoms would be the irrationality of an argument. And that's when you want to stop and say, hey, hold on. That's really not what we want to be talking about right now. Let's just slow down and get back to what our issue is and what the problem is. Um, try to get yourself back on the track rather than the blaming because blaming isn't going to do anything with you. There are people who outwardly will say, I'm fine when they're stressed. If they were fine, they wouldn't be irritable. If they were fine, they wouldn't be frustrated. And it's okay to say, we're not fine. And I don't think there's anybody right now, uh, especially the people who are logged on here this evening, who would say, we're fine with all of this. We're not. And it's okay not to be fine. And it's okay to say, your concern, it's okay to express the worry, it's okay to express the fear. But that's one of the important things is to express it, talk about it, be able to share this with other people so that you're not alone and you know that other people are validating your feelings because clearly everybody has similar feelings, which is what brought us all here this evening together is we do have the same kind of feelings. All right, so what are the signs and symptoms? Headaches, stomach aches, diarrhea, loss of interest in sex, socially avoidant. Um, you know, there are people who are staying in the medic room. They're not hanging out with, in, in the kitchen with everybody else. And um, my perception is a lot of the way 17 is set up because there are people who will stay in the other room while everybody is sitting around the table in the kitchen. Um, eating more, eating less. Uh, getting drunk, drinking more. Um, yes, I know that no one here is doing drugs, but you might see people who are really stressed who are doing more drugs, um, self-medicating with drugs. Uh, you'll see people who are more irritable. They seem to have more conflict at work. They're, they're not their normal, pleasant, cheerful self. Uh, and so you'll see them having more arguments or starting things more. 
I'm fine doesn't mean I'm okay. It means don't bother me. But that's actually when it's time to reach out and say, okay, we're all in this together. Talk about what really is bothering. All right, so let's open this up for some questions. I'm hoping that I covered some of the stuff. I tried to keep it to that 45 minutes that Dr. Sean suggested. What questions do you all have? Some I see a question in the chat. It says, uh, can you speak a little bit more about family? Um, hold on one second. All right, some of us have been- no, one second. Such as yeah, here it is. Uh, I know um, some hospital coworkers say that it's hard when you're at work and so busy all day, come home just need some decompression and quiet time, but then you you're, you know, you have your family at home who have sat around all day and all they wanna do is follow you around and to talk, especially when somebody has a parent living with them, for example, and her mom um, has some dementia and doesn't really understand what's going on at all. Okay, so I see that one, but um, after that, we'll go back up to the one on top of it about the PTSD. There's one that's over top, do you see that? Some um, of us have been managing conditions such as PTSD and depression for years. Many of the tools that we're a, we were able to use to manage are no longer accessible due to recent social distancing restrictions. What resources are available for individuals when normal therapies and coping mechanisms aren't available? What a great question. All right, so let me kind of do, do one at a time here, okay? Um, there, there's a difference between social distancing. And, and um, a friend of mine who's a physician said, you know, we have to be careful with the social distancing. It's not social distancing, it's physical distancing. So there are these chats, there are groups, there are ways of getting together and talking out the PTSD symptoms. And some of the, the ways of managing post-traumatic stress disorder is to be able to talk about it, to do the cognitive work where you can challenge some of the distortions. And you can do that. I know that I'm doing that with many of my clients uh, through these Zoom sessions. So there are resources available and there are, there are meetings that people are doing through these Zoom sessions. I know even the different Anon programs are doing the, these meetings um, on this telehealth and through, through Zoom. So do reach out to whomever were the providers that you've been working with and see if they're doing Zoom sessions and see whether you can connect that way. Um, it is important to reach out and not to be isolated. It's not, the social distancing is not, I think is a misnomer. It really should be physical distancing. Reach out socially, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's with your friends, whether it's with your clinician, whether it's with other people you know who are experiencing similar symptoms. Um, let me just really quick read um, I really don't. Okay, I think um, Okay, so th there's two different things in this one question that was sent to me. Number one, when you're at work, you have all this stress and people at home are going to be worried about you. One of the ways to help them is to let them know exactly what you are doing to protect yourself. If you tell them the protocols and the things that you're doing, they then know you are aware of the safety mechanisms. You're helping them to decrease their stress and their worry because of their unknown by telling them what you're doing specifically to protect yourself and your family. Uh, that's a way to um, decrease their stress. And I know one couple, um, He's a firefighter, and when he comes home, his wife meets him at the front door, and he's not allowed to wear his clothes or his shoes inside, and they, she wants him to get undressed. She meets him at the front door and says, strip. Well, they, of course, laugh about that. He gets to take off all his clothes, and isn't it funny, and isn't it wonderful? They turned it into humor. So these are the kind of things that you can do to help your family reduce the stress around your being out in possible exposure. I know some people are actually quarantining themselves in the garage until they can take off all their clothes and get themselves cleaned up before they come into the house. These are the things that help your family become um, more comfortable. Now, in terms of how your family wants to be involved with you, set up sort of this boundary that says, listen, for when I come home, I need 30 minutes of quiet time 
if you can just give me 30 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever it takes to go in, take a shower, enjoy the hot shower, and then let, then I can come out to you guys. But I need that time to decompress and negotiate this with your family. Let them know what's important to you. Families are really supportive when you give them information, when you tell them this is what's happening. Now, I do understand that sometimes you have family members who can understand whether there's a mental health issue or there is a young child. This is when you, you, you sort of come to the other family members and say, I need you to help me run a buffer and get the support from the family that does understand so that you can take care of yourself. Um, okay, so yes, if you want to just have that, your home is being the quiet place, you can do this two different ways. Number one, you can say, when I come home, I don't want to talk about it. But there are people, you are, you are considered their expert. You know more about this than they do at home. And they want to talk about it a little bit. Set up some parameters whether I can talk about it for just this long, or I'm only gonna talk about it on this day, or I'll let you know when I have some more information. But understand that they too have their worry. Um, they have their concerns as well, and so you're addressing their worries and their concerns. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think there's something wrong with you when you say, I just need to have some private time. I don't think there's anything wrong with you at that point. Um, I think it's totally normal for any of us. Um, I'm sure that myself as well as Dr. Sean, when we come home after a long day of seeing patients, I, I like to just go out and get in the hot tub and forget the day. I mean, I watch the stars at night just to kind of forget the pressure of some of the difficult cases that I've been working with. So I don't think there's anything wrong with us doing that. Uh, let me scroll down here. Okay, other questions that you have? Um, so the one person who sent a message, all it says is there's a message coming, but it doesn't say what it is. So. I'll give, a, give you a couple minutes to do that. While I'm waiting for that question to come through, one of the things I think is really important to say is, you are not mentally unhealthy by experiencing fear. You are not mentally unhealthy by experiencing worry. These are normal conditions for any of us and they are symptomological of not having enough knowledge or of planning things that will be coming in the future that you fear don't you don't have control over. It's a very normal experience, but there are ways to address it. And that's what we've talked about this evening is how to address it, gain knowledge, give yourself permission to be worried for a period of time if you need to be worried, fearful for a period of time if you need to be fearful, and then let it go. You can't perseverate on it and go over and over with it to the point where it becomes obsessive. Other questions? Dr. Dean, did you see the question about um, what says, I get home from work, I don't want to talk about the virus, it's so draining, but my family seems to want to talk, I just want to come home and go to sleep. Is something happening mentally that I may not be aware of? Well, my question to that was, do you mean with the individual writing this, is something happening mentally? Or is are you saying is something happening with your family mentally that you're not aware of? I wasn't sure which way that was going. Let's start with the first one. All right, so if it's that um, you're, you're concerned about yourself, no, you're being quite normal that when you get home, you've had enough. And it, we are human after all. And so it's perfectly normal for you to say, I need a buffer zone. I need to be able to come home and just shed my skin and not be thoughtful about um, all this virus stuff. I've talked about it all day long. I want to be done with it and negotiate with your family. But if you don't communicate with them and you just go to your room and you shut down, that's going to cause more anxiety in the family, more worry and fear in the family because you're just isolating yourself. You have to communicate and communication is essential in all of this fear and worry that everyone has. The more you talk about it, firstly, 
it will decrease the fear, it will decrease the worry. If you don't talk about it, it increases the fear and increases the worry. So negotiate with your family, tell them that you're drained, tell them that you've been talking about it and dealing with it all day long, and you need a break from it. You might need to set a schedule and say, I will talk about it for this long, or I will talk about it on this day, and I'll take care of your fears and your worries, but right now I need to go get in the shower. On the flip side of that, is there something mentally, um, something happening mentally with the family? Yes, they have fear, they have worry, and they're looking to you as a professional to help them take care of that fear and that worry. So both of those situations. That's a beautiful Remember answer. That, sorry? That's a beautiful answer. Remember that marital conflict increases during stressful times. This is not a time to question whether you are testing your marriage or your relationship. This is a time when you look to each other for support rather than you're not on my team. Try to figure out what your spouse needs on their team and work with them and try to be supportive. One of the problems, and I'll just go off a little bit because a lot of this has to do with relationships. Um, we all want to be right. And we fight to be right. And we fight for someone else to be wrong. It doesn't help. There's nothing that is gained by trying to prove you're right, trying to prove someone else is wrong. If there's a factual difference, listen to the other person. It's not that they're trying to be difficult. They have a different understanding. And if we try to understand each other, we get a lot farther in benefit in relationships than if we try to prove somebody else wrong. Um, is way better to be happy. <laughs> well, um, yes, you have to ask that difficult question. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Sometimes it can't be both. You have to make that difficult decision. I would rather be happy and say, you know what? I got it. I'm not interested in arguing. Now, don't, you, you also don't want to be patronizing when you say that. So um, be supportive. Other questions? You know, in terms of, you know, you know, my own experience in healthcare with this COVID crisis, right? I've been um, on the front line several days a week. I've been in the ICUs. I've been taking care of these patients. I've been intubating them. I've been part of different response teams. I mean, it is unbelievably, I wouldn't use the word stressful. It's very intense, the whole thing. I, I really feel as though this is one time in my professional career of 20 years plus, probably when I felt the most anxiety and sadness around all this stuff. So it's been so important to make to, for me to know how do I take care of myself and to do that. And whether that be making sure I exercise, making sure that I sleep, making sure that I eat well, making sure I can, I made a list at the beginning of this of people to stay connected with. Uh, that I need, that need my support and people support that I need. So I really appreciate the message that, yeah, we're all going through this. It unbelievably for some of us provokes a lot of anxiety and sadness. And yeah, we're in it as a community, right? I, I, the support that I feel around this within the hospital community, for example, is pretty spectacular. It's like a strength, so right? It's a strength. Well, I, I, I think the strength comes in, you know, the beauty of this, um, I'm going to get in trouble here, okay, you ready? This tremendous family of first responders. You guys really are a family. I mean, you, 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 and, and I think that's so important to understand. Um, there's two things, I, but first let me kind of get to this question. How can peers or family best support those in grief during these restrictions? Um, first of all, physical touch is so important. Being physically present with someone is so important. But at the same time, knowing someone is there. Um, I spoke with someone today who told me about a tragic situation that um, when, when this person saw the number of support, the number of people who were there to support, they didn't have to touch them, but they all were there and said, we care about you. It was tremendously helpful. So, you know, the, just the idea of, reaching out and saying, I'm thinking of you. The idea of saying, I'm here if you need me. Um, being able to talk to someone, being able to see someone's face on these Zoom sessions. 
that's how you support somebody. Um, calling them, reaching out to them, letting them know that they're not alone. I think those are really important things that you can do for friends and family. Uh, often when someone dies, after the funeral, people start drifting away. They may comment, listen, call me if you need something. But then they don't ever call the, the person who's grieving. And, and you just think, oh, they're okay now because the, the, the funeral is over. They're not. There, there needs to be the ongoing support for quite some time. The person will let you know when they're okay and they don't need you to keep reaching out. But keep calling. Um, there, there's a wonderful song, and I don't know how many of you are into country music. I love country music, so you can all like make comments about me now. But there's a wonderful song called The Call. Um, and I think it's so important. Um, those of us who do um, SISM, we're, we're tremendously aware of the suicidality that's going on um, with, with this virus and with the things going on around the entire first responder community. Um, reaching out and talking to someone, reaching out and calling someone is so important. Listen to the song, The Call, and what it talks about is someone who's in crisis and at the last minute, at just the right minute, they got a phone call from somebody who cared. We can all be that someone who cared. You will be the recipient of someone calling you and you can also pay it forward and be the recipient or be the giver of someone who calls. And I think that's just so important um, for all of you as a family. Um, one of the things that I can tell you, I'm tremendously, tremendously honored. I've been invited to play as the only non-firefighter. I'm learning to play the bagpipes and I'm uh, playing the bagpipes with your fire department band. Um, being invited into that was so, so meaningful. When someone said, I can be a part of your family. When you reach out to someone and you make it known that you care, it's tremendously meaningful. Um, I thought it was his argument. There's a great question um, or comment and um, what's your advice question by Pixel. Did you see that? Uh, wait a minute. I'm reading this next one as a volunteer. My family says, uses our yeah. The argument, it's not my job and I shouldn't put myself at risk during this time. Even though I explained the precautions we take, I'm still worried. I don't personally, it's a lot of stress knowing my family are not supportive words. You know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of how I want to answer this because we had something like this come up in class where someone said, you know, they're a volunteer and they don't want to put their life on the line um, as a volunteer. And, you know, we can look at this in many different ways. Um, we all give of ourselves, and, and I think, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this that won't offend anybody. Um, there are people who will say this is the Christian thing to do. There are people who say they have, this is their calling. And we can never challenge a person when they believe this is personally who they are. We need to ask support from those around us and people who love us, because this is important to each of us, and this is why we do what we do. Um, and all of us have a certain way of giving and a certain way of caring about others. So your family, I would thank them for their love and their caring and, and encourage them to support you in what's meaningful to you and how you want to help others. But be sure to say to them that you really appreciate and that you're very um, thankful and grateful that you have their love um, that you have their um, caring. That's what's so in, important to all of us is to know that we're meaningful. And your, your family is just saying to you, we love you and we care about you and thank them for that. And also encourage them to support you for the things that are so deeply meaningful to you. I'm stressed about the amount of information out there. How frequently you can be. Oh, absolutely. Um, look, information is changing every minute. Um, and, and I think the problem is that we depend on the, the current information and the current information keeps changing and that's causing us tremendous stress. Um, and this is why I'm, I'm suggesting to people stick with your current protocols. The information is going to iron itself out. Be consistent with your protocols as instructed by your medical directors that's what's going to get us all through this. Um, 
your, your stress around the constantly changing protocols or not protocols, but the, the information is very realistic. But if you stick with the protocols and do that, um, it will help you not completely, but it will mitigate the stress and the worry and the fear that you're experiencing. Not totally because there's so much uncertainty and it all seems to change every day, but there are consistencies in the protocols. And that's what I would suggest to people to help reduce the stress. Somebody um, shared privately, they said, we're hearing from EMS providers that they desire more support and compassion from their shift mates when they test positive. They feel that people are afraid of the diagnosis and just want true support from the brotherhood and sisterhood. They feel alienated by the anxiety. Well, you know, it, people are talking about this virus like it's the plague. And, you know, we have to understand both sides of this. Um, and I think that we, we really need to speak to an even larger audience that support can come not just from being next to the person and putting your arm around them, but from expressing care and concern about that person. And there, you know, I've seen with my own eyes and observed that there's this sort of um, challenging relationship between fire and EMS. And they like to tease each other back and forth. And I think there needs to be more compassion between the two that they come together and support each other. And, and um, you may just be able to reach out to the other side, whether it's the fire side and say, hey, you know what? Being supportive means to me asking me how I am when I come back from the call. I would like that kind of support. Um, when you say, I'm okay, I'm fine, people are gonna reach out to you. So coming back and saying, can we just talk about how I feel? Um, and that I know takes a lot of bravery because a lot of people are like, oh, you're not supposed to talk about feelings, you're firefighters and EMT and EMS personnel, you're not supposed to have feelings. But that's not true. I mean, let's just be candid. That's not true. You do have feelings. And I've been around some of the people around the firehouse who go, ah, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. Um, and then I've seen those same people tear up on really difficult calls. It does bother. So ask for the support. Say you want the support and how you want the support. Many times I have seen couples who get angry with each other because they didn't get the birthday present they wanted to get. Did you ask for the birthday present you wanted to get? <laughs> No, <laughs> then you're not going to get the birthday present mm -hmm. you wanted to get. So clearly, if you want the support, ask for it. And how you want it to look when you get that support. There was, um, uh, someone said that in addition on this thread that, um, but knowing people uh, in addition to what you just said, but knowing people don't want to talk to us because they are on the front line. It's like we have the plague. Yes, and, and, and people do look at you as though you have the plague. But I think it's, you know, again, information is your power. Talking about the precautions, talking about what you're doing to protect yourself and your shift mates, your family, your fire family. What are you doing to protect them. They're afraid as well. They're operating from their mechanism of fear. What are you doing to protect your family? So if you give them that information, it decreases their fear. Again, it's, it's about the communication that you give, the same communication that you have with your family. When you tell your family exactly what you are doing to protect them, they reduce their fear and their worry. And they might tell you to strip when you're outside and you can have a smile on your face, but not at the firehouse. Don't do that. But you can even, you know, if you come back from a, yeah, I'm not suggesting that. Okay. But you can come back from a difficult call and you can say, look, I'm going to go take a shower. All right. And your shift mates might say, you know, we really appreciate that. You thought about us. Listen, let me tell you the number of people who have said to me, thank you for taking my temperature outside your office. I really appreciate that. It shows that I care and I'm concerned about their well-being. And there's a sign on my front door that says, please visit the restroom when you come in and wash your hands. People have appreciated that because I'm showing that I am concerned about their well-being, not only for themselves, but for the people coming in before them, that I protected them as well. 
Dean, Dr. Dean, here's an interesting question I missed a little bit up above. It said, how can peers or family best support those in grief during the restrictions? Well, we were talking about that a little bit when we said, you know, the, the support isn't just a matter of physically being there. It's a matter of reaching out calls, cards, emails, text messages. There are different ways that you can be supported. You know, you can um, reach out to someone very simply and say, hello, I care about you. Um, there are many times that I have had someone in my mind and I will simply send them a text thinking of you. Okay, this is a way to express care and concern. Um, just imagine how our patients feel when they show up. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, true. Um, I, I'm seeing, you know, just imagine how our patients feel. Um, you know, when I first started hanging out in the fire department, um, I remember there was a, 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 one of my friends, Chris, um, with a bunch of kids, and he put on the, is my internet okay? I got, your internet connection is unstable. Can you hear yeah, me Yeah, you okay? were a little choppy, but you're back in again. Okay, so um, Chris was putting on a, um, oh, geez, the word just went out of my head. The mask and all. Geez, guys, I feel full. No, 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 no. The, the breathing apparatus mask. SCBA. Um, yeah, thank you. Boy, I look stupid now. Anyway, I guess I won't get my EMT, will I? So, so um, he did that to reduce the fear. And I think that one of the things that has to happen is we have to have a decrease in the fear mechanism by being informed. Yes, imagine what they feel like when we are dressed in, you are dressed in these weird looking outfits. It is scary. Uh, the Surgeon General says at times more than vulnerable, wait a minute, it just jumped at the age 60, also 65 worries it confuses me. You know what, I, 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 I can't speak to what the Surgeon General says, but what I will speak to is your worry and that the questions that you're asking really show the depth of worry. And whether it's 60 or 65, I'm 61, um, you know, we all just take the precautions regardless of the age. Let's just take the precautions. Um, what don't they teach in EMT? They don't teach that in EMT. I don't know what they don't teach, but... Um, Oh, SCBA. Thank you for saving me. I was embarrassed. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, but let's just keep in mind that what you're talking about and what I'm experiencing from your questions is the degree of worry. And I think the most important thing here is that the worry is real and you control the worry by knowledge. And how many times we've heard knowledge is power. The more you just Pay attention to your protocols, the things that your, your, um, your department is teaching you, your training is teaching you. It will help you with the worry. It will help to decrease, not eliminate. You can't eliminate all of this worry and all of this concern. It's there. It's real. We've all gotten through worries before. Um, I don't know the number of women who are on this chat but many have worried about what's going to happen when they get pregnant and they have a child and on the, all the unknown. And, you know, as I was reading the chapter in this Brady book, which I hate, I um, guess I shouldn't say that, but that Brady book is just horrible. Um, <laughs> the number of things, sorry, the number of things that can go wrong, you know, in, in pregnancy, you know, and women still make it through that because, they look for what's the positive and they focus on the positive. And so I'm gonna give you another little piece that maybe I didn't bring up when I was going through all my lecture notes. Look for positive things in your life today. Um, you know, in many of the non-programs, non we talk about gratitude. Look at what's good today. Today, you're not sick. Today, you followed your protocols. You helped other people. You volunteered and you went out and you took care of people who needed you. Um, look at those positives. 
I, I went on a call one time um, with one of the um, EMS supervisors and there was this older woman who uh, hit her head and she was just nervous and she was scared. She had thought in her mind she was going to die that night because she hit her head. And this EMS supervisor came over and just said, you know what? You hit your head. I understand you're worried. Here's how you can reduce your worry. And the woman was so grateful just for the positives of somebody being there. That made the difference. Look for the positives of when you show up at that house, even though you might be wearing a mask and gown and you look funky and you, you're scary, the fact that you're there says someone cared. Look at that positive. There are many positives that people have in their life. Um, sorry by accident. Okay, I don't know what the form is, but okay. Um, so look at the positives that you have on your job. Look at the positives that you have in your life. Look at the positives that you do every day. There's a lot there and be in the gratitude. By the way, I do have to say this. For those of you who are EMTs, I have such tremendous respect for you that you got through this course. I can only tell you, wow, you are awesome people. Cause damn, there's a lot in this book. You just have to share that with you. I have tremendous respect for you. Anyway, and, and by the way, if anybody wants, try to learn how to play the bagpipes. It looks like a really, you know, just a couple notes. That thing is really hard to play. Just be patient. So there's positives. What other questions? So while we're waiting for others, if others have questions, don't forget in the chat, Ashley sent out our link uh, to be able to sign up online via the Google spreadsheet. Um, yeah. I think we're up to date on questions so far, but okay. happy to entertain more. I have a question. Hmm. Do you feel that whether your partner, um, someone, a friend, someone in the fire service is a safe place for you to go to share your feelings. Can you identify someone? I know that we have the SISM team. If you have a bad call, um, I'm a part of your SISM team. I'm the mental health doctor for the SISM team. And I can tell you that there are very compassionate and caring people in the SISM team. So that if you do have a difficulty, if you are struggling with the call, there are people who will come to you. And, and so we have this, it's SISM, is critical incident and stress management. We have a group of very compassionate people. They are peers, they are other firefighters, EMT, um, paramedic people. Um, some are officers, but when they are on these SISM calls, they take off their bugles and their white shirt and they're just one of the fire family. So there are people, but do you feel in your world in the fire service that you have people that you can go to and say, hey, sit with me for five minutes. I just had a sucky call. How do people get a hold of the SISM team as a volunteer? How would somebody activate um, that? Well, good. I'm glad um, one person said we have many. Um, ADO is usually the person that you reach out to to have a SISM um, visit. But there are, I know Chris Santoro is like the program director for SISM, uh, but there are SISM team leaders that, um, but I would say that the primary would be to go to your captain or your chief and say, I would like to have a visit with a SISM member. And they will be able to reach out to the appropriate resource to have a SISM member come to visit with you. If you're really struggling, um, you know, we are here. There are mental health providers here. There are peer support that are here. And this person said, there are many people um, who do. Uh, um, 
hang on, let me just read this. It was a private message. Let me just read it before we go on. Yeah, that's really kind of sad. This person says that, um, unfortunately, people don't know how to keep, oh, hello. Hi, I don't know who that is. Um, hello, <laughs> someone's picture just jumped in. Um, so it is unfortunate that some people do not know how to keep confidentiality and you will learn who around can and who can't keep confidentiality. But I would say to you that if you do feel the need to talk and you need to be assured of confidentiality, those of us who are mental health providers are here for you and you do have the SISM team that is here for you. And we all are very committed to confidentiality. If you have feelings, that you need to work through, we will be here for you. Um, I also just want to acknowledge behind the scene, there are some issues that folks are having copying the link uh, for the sign-in sheet. So we'll oh, keep working okay. on that. You guys totally will get credit. We'll figure out this out. Please so don't spend too much time. There's also a SISM checkbox on the report where you can request uh, the chief for the president of a possible hard call. Um, and so this person says that as a president, they can reach out and, and make sure that the crew is okay and keep an extra eye on them. So yes, that is there. So there are resources you can request SISM that is there and please, please feel free to use that. Whether it's they come to you or I know many times I have gone to a firehouse and um, quote unquote brought ice cream um, uh, for dessert so that I can hang out and have a conversation with anybody who wants to talk. So we are there to help you. We are there to support you and to listen to your feelings and do what we can. We might not be able to remove the pain, but be there to be supportive for you. Yes, officers can request SISM through ADO. That is true. If I didn't say that, I'm sorry. Yes, you can, your whatever officer can contact ADO. Um, and if you're not comfortable with your officer, I would encourage you to go to another officer, go to someone if you are worried about something, reach out to someone else and you will get it. You will be able to get a visit. Um, it will be addressed to have a peer support number stop by our companies and student teams. Wait a minute, I don't understand this. It will be addressed to have a volunteer peer support member stop by our companies and speak to your any office with a president. Okay, so this just says it will be addressed, I'm not quite sure what that meant. It will be addressed to have a volunteer peer support. Yes, that is what the SISM team is. Stop by around companies and speak to your commanding officer or president and or president. So again, there are avenues for you to get support for the emotional part. If you're finding that it's affecting you at home and it's not um, it's something the SISM team, because the SISM team is not, uh, there are, as a mental health provider, I'm on the SISM team, but the SISM team will not send out a SISM member to deal with a personal issue that you're having, for instance, at, at home. I will say to you that as far as I understand, the EAP, is accessible to the volunteers as well, I believe. I've had EAP um, visits with volunteers. Uh, I believe that your, your volunteer company has to refer you to that. Um, but um, the career side does have EAP where if you're having a personal issue or a professional issue, you can reach out to the EAP and get support from uh, a mental health clinician. Um, I was involved in Okay, um, I, there is a list for the, uh, the SISM. However, my understanding is, and for the EAP, yes, but my understanding for the SISM is they really do want that to go through the primary um, assignments of ADO calling SISM and then not everybody just gets a hold of a SISM member and calls them. So they really do want it more centrally located in terms of having a dispatch. Uh, Let me also just read because not everybody can see the chat. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. This one of the members just said I was involved in the two members actually just said I was involved in the chaplain Zoom last meet last night with the chaplains in the volunteer service. We know that most members know about SISM and EAP employee assistance program, but we discussed it would be a great idea to post the numbers around the station so they are readily available. Yes, Another however, question. but let me just speak to that one more time. Yes, I would agree that the EAP should be posted, but the SISM, it is best to have the officer contact the ADO because they really do want that century located. And then um, another member said, I serve as my company chaplain, I've made myself available. Anyone who cares to talk, I was an active riding member for 25 years, so I understand they're, where they're coming from. In addition, a number of BCBFA chaplains met last evening via Zoom to make sure we can be available to our members and neighboring companies. And that's from Steve Owens, thanks Steve. And then Chief Utz writes, good evening, Dr. Dean. The county EAP is available to all members, both career and volunteer. We can help guide anyone who needs assistance. Well, Chief, thank you very much for clarifying. I do know that I have had people here who are on the volunteer side and they've been covered by the EAP. So I would encourage people, you do have Cigna EAP. Um, I know personally here, if someone called here, we call and get your EAP authorization for you. Um, but I'm sure other clinicians who work with your EAP can do the same thing. Um, so I'm glad that you confirmed that for me, Chief. But yes, you, you can get EAP services as well as SISM. And, and, but if it's a personal issue that you're having, it's not related to a specific call, it really isn't appropriate to call um, SISM for that. Um, sorry, I meant the numbers for suicide hotline gap. Um, yes, I, I think that it's a good idea, an excellent idea to have a suicide hotline and gap, et cetera, um, a, a around the station. I think that's a phenomenal idea. I, I'm, I don't know if they already have that, uh, but that's a phenomenal idea. I know that um, as a mental health provider, I can tell you, and even on the SISM team, we are seeing, unfortunately, across the country, an increase in suicidality among first responders. Let me just take a quick moment without reading any um, any of the, the questions. And, and, and I can't take this off so I can just look at this because I can't see very well, so I have to wear this. But the, I want to look right at you and say, if you are feeling that things are getting too much for you, if you are feeling that you are overwhelmed and that you don't know how to get out of wherever you are, we are here. We are supportive. Give us a call. Um, I think everybody in the fire service has my phone number, but if you don't, I, and you privately message me or whatever, I'd be happy to give you my number, happy to get you the suicide hotline. Please know you are not alone if you are one of the people who are struggling, and people do struggle, and people do need help. Then reach out and let us help you. If you see people, if you know someone who is struggling, please not only reach out to them, but reach out to us because we will be there for them as well. Looking at signs and symptoms, let me be clear that sometimes there are no signs and symptoms and that's terribly frustrating. Um, but people who have a history of depression, people who have a history of anxiety, people who have no history of anxiety or depression but just feel overwhelmed and they are isolating and they aren't communicating like they were before. They're just kind of staying away from everybody. Um, there are signs I'm sure you've heard. People don't joke about suicide. If someone says, I'm just going to go home and kill myself, that is a warning sign. Please don't take that lightly. It's not a joke. And I tell people often, that is not something to joke about. And I will let you know how serious it is because I will come to you and make sure you are okay. So I don't joke about those kind of things. But if you are in danger, if you are scared, if you are worried, if you are hurting, there are those out there, we are all out here to help you and care about you. I'll go back to the questions. I'll step off my soapbox, but I want to make sure I make that very, very clear. Um, yeah, I see a comment from Eric. Everyone says an updated uh, Baltimore County Fire Department SISM team and chaplain list was emailed out since the coronavirus started approximately a week or so ago. Okay, so here again, um, I, do not know whether, uh, it is my understanding that SISM dispatch should go through ADO who will contact the appropriate SISM team because there's east side, west side teams. There are teams of SISM providers. And so I'm gonna stay with 
it is best to go through ADO and have them contact the appropriate SISM person to respond to a call. EAP, you can do yourself. Um, you can reach out on your own. And yeah, I didn't understand GET, so I'm glad you clarified that that was EAP. Um, but EAP, mental health, um, you can reach out on your own. That does not have to be referred. I think that's all I see in the questions. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for letting me be here with you. And I hope it's been helpful. I hope you've gained something from our chat this evening. If you have questions, you can always email me. Um, I'm at drdean at drdean.org is the easiest um, email for me. Um, always you know, reach out if you need help. Don't sit by yourself. Have a good night, guys. Dr. Dean, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your commitment. Off. Thank you. I will stick around here until everybody logs off to make sure that there's no questions that anybody has. So I'll hang out. <laughs>